Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carver. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Simple Solutions for Complex Cases, How to Manage Keratoconus Patients with Cataracts. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Enter in your questions as soon as you can, and we'll discuss them at the end of Dr. Trattler's presentation. Our speaker tonight is William B. Trattler, MD. He is a refractive corneal and cataract eye surgeon at the Center for Excellence in Eye Care, who lectures extensively across the US in improving visual outcomes with various eye surgeries and procedures. Dr. Trattler performs a wide variety of cataract and refractive surgeries and, involve, and is involved in treating corneal diseases such as keratoconus and post-LASIK ectasia with corneal collagen cross-linking and other procedures. His involvement in the FDA-approved study for CXL helped lead to its approval in 2016. Dr. Trailer has been a leader in the EpiOn CXL, which he's performed as part of the CXL USA study since 2010, and he, or, and he lectures nationally on this topic. But tonight, I'm excited to learn from Dr. Trailer as he talks about something that's not discussed too often, keratoconus, or patients that have both keratoconus and cataracts. Welcome, Dr. Trattler. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so honored. I appreciate Oculus uh, allowing me to present. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics, talking about keratoconus, and I do lots of cataract surgery, so it's a very important topic, and um, I think we see more and more patients with both cataracts and keratoconus than we originally thought that we would see. So I hope it's helpful. We're going to talk about a lot of different situations um, and how the various technologies can help us. Move forward. Um, I work with a lot of companies, and the most relevant ones here for this talk are, are Oculus, uh, RX Sight, Zeiss, um, and also across the community, CXLO, and Glacos. Um, so I think that we're all aware that keratoconus is progressive. Um, it's definitely more common than we once thought, and it can definitely progress in our older patients, those that are coming in and have cataracts, um, and those that have had cataract surgery. So just when we identify a patient with keratoconus, we need to keep watching them, even if they're in their 70s or 80s, because they can progress. Uh, just like we follow glaucoma patients, we have to keep following our keratoconus patients. There are some challenges in, in patients with cataracts that also have keratoconus. First, the important thing is to make the diagnosis preoperatively. Um, and so I am a big fan of doing a screening topography prior to all cataract surgeries. I don't charge for this test, but it's helpful and I pick up a lot of patients. Um, we'll discuss cross-linking or cataract surgery first. We'll talk about lens power calculations. It's definitely a challenging situation, and patients often end up a little bit more hyperopic than intended. And also, when to choose monofocal versus toric IOLs. So first, let's just talk about some basics about um, topography and you know, tomography and the diagnosis. And just, I'm sure we're all good at pattern recognition, but just pointing out that the image on the left is keratoconus. This image here, this is called pellucid pattern keratoconus. It, people will sometimes call this pellucid because there's this crab claw appearance in the middle, but the thinnest spot is actually quite central, and this would be more of a keratoconus with a pellucid pattern. And then the last image here, all the way on the right, is actually pellucid marginal degeneration, where the thin spot is quite peripheral. Um, and these patients can end up with 15, 20, or even 30 doctors of astigmatism. Um, so they're quite interesting patients. So why is this progressive condition difficult to diagnose early? This is a common uh, question, because We'll often see patients coming in and, you know, for LASIK consultations, they didn't realize they had it. Coming for cataract consultations, they didn't realize they had keratoconus. Why is it difficult to diagnose? I think it's often because it's asymptomatic. Patients may not realize it. They think their vision is just a little blurry. They're not sure why, but it's not that important. They can do all the things they want to do. And then on a slow exam, they go to see an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, um, even a corneal specialist, and unless they do a topography or a tomography, you won't know the shape of the cornea because most patients with keratoconus or, or patients with keratoconus who have mild to moderate disease typically have a normal sun lamp exam. It's not until the, the, the condition is much more advanced that you start to see actual thinning that's visible as well as apical scarring and other signs of keratoconus. So the other thing now is that we do have treatments that are available. So the earlier we can diagnose, the better. Um, and then if you catch these patients early, they can actually be eligible for future refractive surgery or have great results with cataract surgery. So again, the sooner we identify patients, the better. So how common is it? I, this is a study, this is a more recent study. Um, while many people kind of think about, remember the study that said one in 2000, uh, this study from the Netherlands uh, uh, found that 
uh, the incidence or prevalence of keratoconus is one in 375. So much more common than we once thought. If you think about how many cataract surgeries you do uh, in a year, and if you perform 375 patients or eyes, um, there's a chance that at least one a year will be, have keratoconus. If you perform 750, then two patients will have keratoconus. And actually, I think the number may be higher in the United States than our cataract patients. I'll, I'll share my information in my study uh, where I looked at my patients. But um, it's definitely much more common, and we're going to see this quite commonly. It's important to notice also that as far as age of diagnosis, uh, the, uh, the on this study, the average age was 28.3. So while there's definitely younger kids that are identified, patients in their 30s, 40s, and 50s are, are, are often the, at the first time that they're diagnosed. Whether that means that they didn't have any signs of keratoconus until they were 30, 40, or 50, or they just were never diagnosed, it's hard to tell. But again, a lot of patients are diagnosed later in life. Um, and there is a problem, there are more uh, males than females that have keratoconus. Um, now, this is an interesting study. This is an interesting group of studies. Um, it, this is, um, these are studies from different countries that have found that the incidence of or prevalence of keratoconus um, could actually be higher than 1%. So um, in India, the study they found is 2.3%. In Israel, it's 2.3%. China was 0.9%. Iran was 2.5%. I shared with you the Netherlands study, which is 0.26%. Saudi Arabia was almost 5%. Um, there's a global uh, meta-analysis that found about 0.14% or 1 in 700. But um, we'll have to, again, I think that the numbers are much higher than we once thought. I did my own study. I looked at 400 consecutive patients, uh, 400 consecutive eyes of 200 patients that underwent cataract surgery. So 200 consecutive patients, 400 eyes that underwent surgery. What I did is um, I, we, I, I had a medical student that helped me masked um, all of the um, images, I had to grade each of the images. And uh, it was surprising that after we removed the 63 eyes that had previous coronal surgery, um, we found that 24% had not normal topography. Um, and of those, and I'm sorry, these numbers, I don't know what happened with the, they moved this slide over from a different uh, presentation, but um, it was 3% were actually keratoconus. Um, form of keratoconus is 1.6%. Borderline form of keratoconus or pellucid, which is where you could just see some early signs that it wasn't quite keratoconus, um, was about 6%. And a lot of patients had a pellucid pattern or superior steepening as well. So uh, if you do topography, you're going to be surprised at how common you'll find abnormal topography. Again, this study is almost 25%. Uh, so that's the key is that, um, that the reason I perform topography in my patients routinely is because I, I find pa every day I see patients with cataracts, I also find abnormal topographic uh, findings that are not visible on certain exam, and so it's a helpful tool. Again, if it's a screening test, we do not charge for it. I don't think you can, so it's just you, but it is helpful to identify ahead of time. So do not charge insurance for screening tests. So again, the major problem is that the sodium signs of keratoconus are often only visible when the condition is moderate to severe. Um, and this is interesting. These are some patients that came in um, and we checked the uncorrected vision. Um, and these patients, all four, four different patients, all have keratoconus. You can see there's you know, the red uh, steepening, um, probably the second and fourth have the more advanced cases. But surprisingly enough, when we checked their vision, and we checked it more than once in more than one day, they actually could read 2020, 2020 minus, 2020, and 2020. So um, as I'm trying to share it, these patients have keratoconus, so they could still, in a, an exam, see the 2020 line. And of course, if you don't perform topography, you would never pick up that they also had keratoconus. Uh, they may, they did, did, some of these patients did have complaints of ghosting and symptoms of blurred vision, but they could read down to 2020, uncorrected. Now, the reason I'm a big fan of topography also is that we can use it to track changes over time. So this is a patient that came in, 20-year-old male that came in had this little inferior steepening uh, in their left eye. So you can see that the top part is green at 44.3, the bottom part is 45.5. So there's a little bit of a gradient or, or inferior steepening from top to bottom. Um, so the suspect for keratoconus, um, we watched this patient and the patient came back um, two years later and look, you can see the progression where uh, and the colors have changed uh, where the top part got flatter and the bottom part got steeper. So in keratoconus, just to explain, you're not going to see that 
the cone just gets steeper and that's it. Actually, you see a reshaping of the cornea where one part gets flat, another part gets steeper. And you can see that on the difference map here where the bottom part gets steeper and the top part gets flatter. Um, the difference map is one of my favorite technologies or ways to evaluate patients over time, whether they're patients that that are have had previous LASIK, um, whether you know they're coming in from one exam to another exam, and they've had cross-linking, things like that. I always love these maps because they really are quite helpful. You can see it got flatter above and steeper below. So everyone says that, you know, gosh, and I had a patient today, uh, I got a call. The, the, the question was, the patient was in their um, 50s. They actually had ectasia, so ectasia after LASIK, and one doctor said cross-link, and another doctor said no cross-link, just wear square lenses. Because at that age, they're unlikely to progress. But that's not true. And we see patients all the time that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that progress. And the only way you track them is if you actually do a map and you see them over time. If you say, hey, you look pretty good, and you ask them, they may not know because it's so slow. It's like if you ask someone, is your hair longer than it was three days ago, they can't tell you, that they, oh, it's about the same. And same thing here, it's just so subtle, the changes over time. Um, so, but if you look at these maps, here's a patient, their, their central Ks are 54, their K max is 55.2. So this is, the patient saw me in 2015, uh, they then came back in 2018, so it was uh, almost three years later. And you can see that essentially it went from 54.4 to 56.9, right in the middle. The K max went all the way up to 58.6. And when you use the difference map, you can see that there's significant worsening of this patient's cornea. Now, um, Again, if you don't ha compare from you know one visit to the next, you don't know if they're progressing or not. And to say tell patients they're in their 40s, oh, you're not likely to progress. Uh, unfortunately, when they get this level of progression, they're having loss of vision. And even though you could cross link them, they're not going to get all the way back to where they were in 2015. So here's a patient, 70 year old patient um, with early keratoconus. Um, you can see here that uh, they have a, uh, what we call a um, truncated bow tie where the K max is 52.2, so we know that's abnormal. Uh, it's kind of irregular, where it's uh, on the, towards our left um, is the right eye. So temporally, you see this, um, it's much steeper and irregular. Um, so uh, this patient has a horizontal uh, keratoconus. 2008, they came in, um, and they did end up having surgery in 2011, cataract surgery. Um, and this is how they looked in 2015. So you can see that they had significant worsening from K-max of 52.2 to 56.9. And the difference map shows that significant um, central steeping. So this is not from an incision. This is not they made an incision and the incision gaped or something like this. This is actual progression of this condition and the K-max worsened at 4.7. So just because you're seven years old does not mean that you're out, you're, you're, you know, not at risk for getting uh, progression. Uh, I, I know the patients come back and see me. I the patient actually did have cross-linking already. Um, and you can see the patient now is 82, I think 81. So, um, no, 82 already. So, you know, again, you want to catch these patients, you know, and, and follow them and treat them if they present. Uh, here's a patient in their 50s. So they presented 52 with the, um, with the central one, um, where it's 49.8, 2011. They came back um, three years, six months later. You can see um, off to the left, sorry, I didn't use animations here. That, that now in 2015, their K-max went to 59.1, so they worsened by 9.4 doctors. Um, this is a patient in their 50s. So again, um, you know, we really want to identify and treat these patients, not just say, tell them they're not going to progress. Here's another 70-year-old patient uh, came back, came to see me in 2011. This patient was born in 1941. Um, they had cataract surgery in December 2011, um, and they saw me back in 2016. You can see that they, um, their K-max went from 54.5 to 56. And the difference map shows this area of inferior steepening uh, through 2016. Uh, the patient wasn't ready to have any type of procedure at that time. We talked about cross-linking. Here's the 2016. They came back again in 2018. And now you can see the K-max is getting worse again. They went from 56 to 57.1. Difference map shows further steepening of that of the steep part of the cornea. So this patient's still progressing. And the patient, again, um, born in 1941 uh, in their uh, mid-70s. So they can definitely progress. Now let's just talk about, change the topic a little bit. Let's talk about care to, uh, LASIK. So when you have patients that undergo LASIK, um, you get this typical map where you see a flat blue center, 
and a, a red periphery, which is a steep area. So basically you're taking a cornea for myopic LASIK um, and flattening the middle and the, the edges are a little steeper. And so um, here's the, our scale on the left. Um, this is the history of myopic LASIK. These are two different patients, but you can see here's our typical pattern that we expect to see. Um, this is um, this patient's history of LASIK. You see the central area is red. So what that means is that they have post-hyperopic LASIK. So they've had previous hyperopic LASIK with central steepening. And this could look a little bit like keratoconus, but there's a diff certainly a distinctness between them, uh, but just to be aware of, of these maps. So let's just talk about this patient. So a patient comes in, they, they're 68 years old. Um, they have ca cataracts. Their best corrective visual acuity is 2050. The, you perform an OCT, it's normal. So the exam is clear, clear cornea, no glutide opacities, two plus cataract consistent with the 2050 vision. And my question is, does this patient have a coronal condition that may affect their, their, their post-operative vision? And the answer is that unless you do topography or tomography, you won't know the answer. And this patient actually has a, has a, a small degree of keratoconus. See that it's inferior steepening, it's mild. Uh, they may end up 2020 minus, 2025 plus after surgery. But again, if they're not seeing great, they're having a little ghosting after cataract surgery, they're gonna say, what's wrong? It's always better to you know, get the scan and tell them earlier before surgery than figure this out after surgery. Now here's another patient. This patient had a history of myopic LASIK, and this is a case courtesy of a fantastic ophthalmologist in Miami, Jennifer Lowe, um, one of my close colleagues. Um, anyway, so she saw this patient, and the patient had a history of myopic LASIK, um, and the Ks in the right eye were 3.3, Sorry, the, the stigmatism was 3.36 hours of stigmatism in the right eye and 1.44 hours of stigmatism in the left eye. And again, this patient had previous LASIK. So when you have LASIK, you know, unless there's a horrible complication at the time of surgery, which is rare, uh, they're typically going to have less than adaptive stigmatism postoperatively. So, you know, 1.44, you know, maybe there's some subtle changes, but when you get to 3.36, you have to be concerned something's going on. So topography is performed. Um, and this is the patient, what the patient looked like. You could see um, they have this area of red. I, I showed you previously that, um, in my case, you can have a blue central area, but here we see this area of steepening. This is actually post ectasia, kind of this area of steepening in that flat area is, is, is bulging outwards. Um, now here, because of this irregularity and there's really no access to the signature, then you want to avoid a toric lens. This is not the time to place, uh, place a toric lens. Uh, because it's, there's no real access to astigmatism, and it could easily shift if the patient progresses, or shift if this patient has keratoconus, because again, there's not a clear axis, so uh, it could, you, it's just not the best idea to use a torque lens here. Um, I, I place a monofocal lens, um, and definitely, this is a patient that you want to crosslink sooner rather than later, because you're catching them at a relatively early stage, so if they keep getting worse and worse, it could be a lot worse for this patient. So again, here's an example of previous myopic LASIK, no ectasia on the left. And here's another example of a patient with myopic ectasia centrally. So you can see the blue area is flat in the 40 range, 39 to 40 range, but all of a sudden they have 43.0 right flow center. That's an area of ectasia for this patient. Um, and here's another example. Um, this is different than the one of Dr. Lowe's. Um, but you can see the same type of thing, this area bulging outwards inferiorly. And again, these, these type of cases, if you can identify them, treat them early, and really prevent them from getting advanced ectasia and, and preserve a lot of really good vision for them. So let's talk about some IL decision making with in patients with keratoconus, pellucid, or ectasia. So the, one of the biggest questions I get all the time is, when do you consider a toric lens in patients with keratoconus or pellucid or post ectasia? And I think the first thing I try to do is I try to see if I can identify the axis of astigmatism. And in, in this particular case, um, you know, you can look around, but it's not really obvious. It's probably in this one horizontal, actually, um, a horizontal astigmatism. Um, but, you know, I always wonder how truly stable this is, would be over time. You know, either you cross-link them or they progress um, or change over time. So I'm not a big fan of this particular situation to put a toric lens. Um, I would just use a, a high-definition monofocal. I usually like to use an, a, a spheric eye well that ha that's called a neutral spheric. It doesn't have any... Uh, asphericity power to it. Um, and I believe there's more than one on the market now, but um, you know, you try to use a monofocal lens in this type of case. How about this one? Uh, this patient has um, significant regular astigmatism, 
They've got 6.5 drops of astigmatism at axis 152. And we can kind of see that astigmatism here, where it is possible you could place a toric lens at 152, and they might do okay. But the problem is, is that they have so much irregularity. They got they're flat above, very steep below. They're going to have reduction of best corrective visual acuity. This patient may end up needing a scleral lens. Um, I'm a big fan of scleral lenses versus RGPs. And it's better not to have a torque lens if you're going to do a scleral lens. So um, I typically, typically would use a monofocal lens and then use a recommend scleral lens fitting afterwards. And then also consider cross linking. So here's a patient with more of a pellucid pattern type of case. Um, and the question is, can this patient have a torque lens? And in this case, I do feel very comfortable. Um, this patient um, has 3.58 drops of astigmatism at axis 172, um, and actually did place a torque lens in this patient. Um, so I think if you look centrally, you could see that in the very middle, uh, the astigmatism is quite regular. Um, so the patient did and did quite well with the torque lens. Here's another example where um, you know this patient has a skewed axis uh, and has a pellucid pattern. You can see that there's also um, some flattening above where it's green and a little bit steeper below. Um, so we have a gradient where it's flatter above again and, and steeper below. So, I mean, we do have a couple of choices. Um, you definitely don't want to put an LRI or AK. If you do, this is a patient that will have ectasia after that type of case where they have irregular astigmatism. Um, so you want to avoid LRI or AK. I mean, I think you can place a toric lens here. Um, you can see the axis, you know, it's horizontal and they should do quite well with a toric lens. You can see if you look centrally um, and kind of highlight this area, you can kind of see the axis and place a lens along that axis. They would do quite well in the visual axis. So here's another case, and this is what I'm a little more iffy on because you can see that, um, and I kind of highlighted that there's a good, you can see the astigmatism. There's a pretty big gradient where um, you see there's a number 45 or in the area that I highlighted, then 47.3, then 49.4, then 49.9. So you go from 45 to 49.9. So five drops of astigmatism, more or less than the pupillary axis or the visual axis, and even if you place a torque lens, they're probably going to have some reduced um, quality of vision. So here, I'd probably do a monofocal and, and recommend a scleral lens, and then you can also consider cross-linking. So here's a patient, six-year-old male with keratoconus and cataracts. Again, here you can see the, the, the astigmatism a little bit easier. Um, so I do think a, a torque lens could be used. You could also use a monofocal. Uh, and then consider cross-linking in the future. Now, here's an interesting case. Uh, this patient has a, almost a doctor and a half of astigmatism horizontally. Um, and there's different options that we have. We have the TORC IOL, manual case, uh, manual AK or LRI, or femto AKs at the time of surgery. So there's a couple of things we could consider doing. And here's the topography map. And I know it looks similar to one of the other ones I showed. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately for this patient, uh, the surgeon did not recognize that this there's a skewed axis here. Um, they saw the patient, they made it thought it was a little dryness, but they went ahead and said, okay, this patient has some astigmatism, I'm going to try to correct it. Um, you can see, again, there's inferior steepening where it's 42 above and 45 below. So, th so this is a pellucid pattern with inferior steepening. So what happened was the patient had cataract surgery, um, them two AKs were placed, um, and this is what they look like uh, postoperatively. You can see that the, the patient's cornea was highly sensitive and the axis flipped and it's actually quite irregular. So instead of having 1.4 doctors of astigmatism at 180, they now have 2.4 doctors of astigmatism and they're doing a lot worse. So you do want to really identify and really look carefully at your patients prior to AKs and LRIs especially. Um, and then, you know, again, this patient was quite uh, unhappy. Um, they could have had a torque lens and done beautifully. So just to share that. So this is a very interesting case, and this patient does not have keratoconus, but take a look here. This patient has irregular astigmatism. They have 2.2 doctors of astigmatism um, on, on the pentacam, um, and you see here they have a flat area, and it's actually from a scar. They have this um, kind of faint superior scar, and they have this area of seeping below that. So maybe it's a sign of ectasia. It's hard to know. Uh, this is not classic for keratoconus, so I thought it was more just irregular astigmatism. So we talked about the patient's options. Um, we got the biometry as well, and they, they, that lined up a little bit better, about one and a half hours at axis 75 on average of that. But then it was about 79 with 2.2 doctors of astigmatism on uh, Pentacam, and what do you believe, what do you do? Uh, plus there's an effective posterior corneal astigmatism. We don't know how that funny irregularity on the interior surface of the cornea might affect things. So we talked about different options. Um, I looked at everything, and uh, 
you know, it's hard, it's hard to know what would be best, what formula to use. Um, so we actually decided to use a light adjustable lens. And I'm just showing this one case. Um, it's definitely something that we can also consider for keratoconus and, and early keratoconus. It, it can't correct huge misses um, and also cannot correct irregular astigmatism. So you're, you really want to treat it, use it for patients because it does cost extra on uh, patients that um, have, where you believe that they're going to get pretty good vision after surgery and that you could use the adjustable lens to fine tune the vision. So in this case, you can see here that about five weeks after surgery, they were 2040 with this distinct, with actually I missed on the hyperopic side. Uh, so they had some hyperopia, uh, plano plus 125 uh, of astigmatism. And then we did our first adjustment. And after just a week, they were at 2030 plus. And the prescription had changed to minus a quarter plus 0.75. So still close, but not right there, quite there yet. Um, then we did a second light treatment and got them down to 2025 plus um, uncorrected with a very small correction. Um, and then when they came back to see me, you can see they ended up with uh, minus 0.5 sphere, 2025 uncorrected. So they were really, really happy uh, with this, this type of option. I think light adjustable lens will be an option for patients with, with mild keratoconus. Now, one thing that we can all consider, with, no matter what lens technology you have in your office, is uh, the Penicam software that Dr. Jack Holiday developed, which is called uh, the Holiday Report. Um, and he, um, and he actually really developed this report so that we can use um, the numbers from his report in our biometry so we can better calculate IOLs. And so he developed a, techno a, I guess a, a mathematical formula that results in something called the EKR65, which is basically a, a method for measuring the steepness of the cornea, both the front and back surface that you can use in a formula. Uh, for you know for Iowa calculations, um, so so the EKR65 um, does include the back surface power, uh, but it's kind of optimized so it really shows just a formula that you can plug right into the typical formulas like the Barrett formula and things like that. So this is what the report looks like. It looks a little busy at first. I do apologize. I did circle and read a couple key things, which is number one, you can see here that the EKR65 mean um, at different pupil sizes as you go across the top left box is quite helpful. And so if you had someone with a really tiny pupil, you can see what case you might use. But uh, Dr. Holiday recommends using the, the 4.5 millimeter for most patients. And here it ends up being 45.14. And I should share the SIM case were 48.4 mean. So it's quite a big difference. So uh, in biometry, it would be the same amount. So it, it does tend to run a little flatter. And that's, and as you know, with, when we do, IOL calculations we, for patients with keratoconus, we often end up on the hyperopic side. So by making by following this, you're going to be less hyperopic. I will right, we'll talk a little bit about that. So it is something you could just plug right into your uh, formula. Um, and here's just an example. So we're going to compare the Penicam and IOL master case on the Howard report. So on the left hand side um, is you see the 46.5 in this particular is a different case than the one I just showed is the SIM case in the Penicam for this patient I'm showing. And then on the right is the EKR65. So uh, it's, the Penicamp says 46.5 um, SIM case, 43.78 is the EKR65, the 4.5 millimeter zone. Then I did um, IO Master and I got um, 47.2. So measuring it's much deeper than EKR65. So what does that mean? So I just ran uh, you know, on the computer. Um, I just plug these Ks in, and everything else is the same as the Barrett Universal Formula. So if I plug in the 47.2 K um, report, I would put a 10.5. I usually target minus two, uh, so I put a 10.5 dot per lens in. Um, this is a 119.3 um, A constant. Um, so I pick a 10.5, and that typically works. You know, it all depends, but you know, it's my fudge. Uh, but now if I'm using this. If you put in the 43.78. It tells you if you really want to go right for planet, you could shoot 12.5. If you wanted the 10.5, you'd actually be quite hyperopic. Um, and so, uh, let's see here. Um, so you can see that uh, you could use the regular numbers and target minus two, uh, or you could use the EKR65 and go a little bit more towards Plano. Um, and, but you can see here, if you picked 11.5 doctor, uh, you with our biometry, it tells us to pick. A minus two, it would, you'd end up minus 2.65. But on, with the SIM case, with the um, 
EKR65, it actually it predicts that you'd end up hyperopic. So there's quite a big difference. But it's just something to play with. I recommend doing a couple of cases where you look at both um, and try to get a sense of how it works in your practice. Um, and you might, you know, again, I, with the EKR65, I still wouldn't shoot for too close to the plane. I'd probably target a minus 0.75 or minus 1 to be safe. Uh, but it is a, a, an option for you. Now, besides, you know, Iowa planning, I do want to talk about uh, another very important topic, which is the scale. So this is a patient that uh, is being evaluated. You can see that they have, they're all green. Uh, and the question is, this, does this patient have regular or irregular astigmatism? And when you look, it's hard to tell. There's a lot of green, some darker green, some lighter green. Uh, the, the issue here is that um, there is some inferior steepening, uh, which isn't quite obvious when you look at the when you look at the colors, but it is obvious when you look at the numbers. Um, and I think the main issue is that the scale is a 1.5 doctor scale, and so you really miss a lot of information. Um, so it can make it really tough to interpret when you go that that far out. So if you switch it to a 0.5 doctor scale, and just to mention, I, I actually like a 0.25 doctor scale, but you go to 0.5, now you can see all the differences quite easily. The same if you're steepening, but you can also see there's a horizontal stigmatism and then almost a pulsive pattern. So you learn a lot more by doing that. So a more detailed scale provides more information, and you can go for the 0.5 or even the 0.25 scale. Now here's an example, just showing, again, the, the original one to the more optimized scale. Uh, that hopefully can be helpful. It's very easy to change the scale on your uh, whatever spark device you're using um, overall. So here's another patient. Um, is this topography concerning? This is a 1.5 doctor scale on the left. See, it looks, you know, you see a little irregularity, but nothing jumps out at you. Uh, if you look at the numbers, you'd be a little more concerned. Uh, but then if you go to this side and you make it a 0.5 doctor scale, then it's pretty obvious that it's 44.1 above, 47.3, just below the center of the apex. Um, and it's quite a significant amount of inferior steeping. So this patient has uh, some degree of keratoconus, um, and it could have been somewhat missed on the first image, but easily picked up with the 0.5 doctor scale. Again, I like even the 0.25 doctor scale. So now let's talk about cross-linking, and um, we'll get back to cataracts along with this as well. But as you know, cross-linking um, can be used for keratoconus, post ectasia, inclusive marginal degeneration, which is off-label in the United States, and also RK with diurnal fluctuations, which is also off-label. So currently, uh, the FDA approves uh, um, cross-linking for both keratoconus and post lasik ectasia, and is off-label for inclusive marginal degeneration. You might see an RK patient here or there, but that's pretty rare. So the one thing I like to always emphasize is that cross-linking does more than stop the progression of keratoconus. It, it's very effective at stopping progression of keratoconus, uh, 98 to 99% successful. But more importantly, you get flattening and reshaping of the cornea after crosslinking, and that can, on many cases, result in improved uncorrected visual acuity and improved best corrected visual acuity. So it does it does a lot, and we see patients year over year. I'm um, getting better and better over time. So it can make a, a quite a nice difference. Um, here's the FDA-approved method of crosslinking. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but just in case you're not, it's, uh, the epithelium is removed. Then we do, do 30 minutes of riboflavin loading. Uh, and then after that, you check in the lamp and confirm sufficient riboflavin is present uh, in the eye. Um, the label says in the anterior chamber looking for flare. Uh, please look at the cornea and make sure there's a nice amount of riboflavin in the cornea that the cornea is saturated because I can show you examples of cases where I can get, I can load a cornea in irregularly and get one area of loading um, but get plenty of flare, but the cornea is not uniformly loaded and you get a funny reaction. So you also, um, per the FDA label, want to check corneal thickness at the end of loading. Um, and if you want to be above 400 microns or 400 or higher, if not, you can swell the cornea with hypotonic saline until you get to, four, or, or hypotonic riboflavin, get to 400 microns or higher, and then initiate the UV light. And it's uh, 30 minutes of light um, continuous. So what happens um, over five years of following crossing keynote, most studies you see are short term. They show you six month data, one year data, maybe two year data. And there's some longer studies, but you know, as I've, I'm fortunate to be following patients for uh, over 10 years with, with cross linking, you see some pretty remarkable results. So here's a patient, uh, they came in um, in 2011, um, they came back in 2016, um, and their, their K-max went from 53.6 to 49.2, um, so some nice flattening. And the difference map shows that the cone got flatter 
this, the flat part got steeper. So it was more than just um, the, the flattening of the steep part of the cornea. The, the blue part gets, the flat part gets steeper and that rounds out the cornea so it becomes less irregular. Um, so I tell my patients, I kind of look at these maps and since blue is flatter, I say it's like the oceans and the oceans are rising in this situation. And you can see that this patient um, over this time frame, over five years, got 4.4 doctors of flattening of their K-max. Now, what about this patient? This is a 33-year-old male patient. So this patient had keratoconus. And you can see when they came to see me uh, almost a year ago in February, they looked pretty symmetrical. It might be a truncated bow tie. But you can see that you know, the top and bottom are pretty even. And so most people will not call this keratoconus. The cornea is on the thinner side. But I would say that, you know, if you look at it objectively, this is not keratoconus at this time. Of course, this is actually a trick slide because, and I'll show you, this is how the patient looked in 2017. They had pretty obvious keratoconus, so the K-max of 48.4, um, and they came back after the cross linking uh, in 2020, and now you can see that they normalized. And the difference map shows you that the steep part got flatter, the flat part got significantly steeper, and now it looks much more symmetrical. So we, I have plenty of examples of patients that start off with keratoconus, no question they have keratoconus on, on their pentacam or on tomography and topography. And then they come back, you know, usually two to five years later, and they have normalization of their corneal shape. Uh, so it's pretty exciting and love, love seeing these type of cases. Now, just to explain, this is a different patient, not the one I just showed you, but you know, if you actually track the K-max over time, many patients can have continuous improvement of their K-max where you get flattening and reshaping of the cornea um, over time. So the K-max goes down and down. So here's a patient. Um, where you know they start off at 55.8, then 15 months later they're, they're 2.8 doctors flatter, then at two years three months they're 3.5 doctors flatter, at three years there are 4.3 doctors flatter, and at five years there's six doctors flatter. So you can see this um, curve going off to the right, but um, it's pretty remarkable um, the change you can see over time. And I try to tell my patients it's not just the first, second, or third year. I mean even five, six, seven, eight, nine years and 10 years, you can see more improvement in the corner shape. Again, not, it should point out not everyone gets improvement, but lots of patients do. And it's pretty exciting for the patient and obviously for the doctor. So now one question that comes up, and I do want to just cover this part, is if you're going to place a torque lens in a patient that has more of a symmetrical um, pellucid pattern where the central area is symmetrical, I like guess in this case, you know, what's going to happen if you cross link them over time? What type of changes do you see? Um, so this patient actually had cross-linking in 2012, and this is how they look four years, four months later, where you can see that the astigmatism is, looks relatively similar. Um, they had 5.8 times of astigmatism to start off with. They dropped to 4.9, and the astigmatism did shift by 5 degrees, from 25.1 to essentially 19.9 or 20. So it was a 5-degree shift. Um, so they would have a slight, you know, if you had a place of toric lens, you know, max toric lens, you're going to get a little reduction in effectiveness as the coronal shifts. But... The, the patient I still would use a torque lens because of the high amount of astigmatism and and they are relatively stable over time. Oops, sorry, let me go backwards. So what about um, are there future directions? What else do we have in the in the pipeline for patients with keratoconus? So this is one of the technologies I'm pretty excited about are these small aperture IOLs, which are available in Europe and Australia and South America already. Hopefully they'll be available in the US soon. Um, AccuFocus is one of the country is one of the companies that's making this. And that's an example there on the right. And it's really effective for keratoconus. Um, so what happens is, um, you can see there's this dark circle. Um, and so patients, when they're looking out in the world, uh, they're looking through the small aperture. So I did my best to try to show this example. So in a regular IOL, you can see that um, they have a large aperture. And um, you can see it at you know, nighttime, the pupil dilates. And you can go, you have a huge gradient in the, in the coronal shape, and that's why you get poor vision. But with the IC8, which is the, you know, the, you know, the, um, this type of technology, where it's a, kind of like a pinhole IOL technology, see that the aperture is quite small. There's a lot less irregular astigmatism because it's a small aperture, and patients can get significantly improved vision. So it's pretty exciting. Now, obviously, I guess the last thing that, you know, again, um, lots of things to talk about. Happy to answer questions at the end, too. but um, I'm a huge fan of scar lenses. I do not fit them. Um, and actually, in our practice, we do not fit them. We actually um, are, are, we do have our, our um, contact lens specialist who fits scar lenses actually just uh, moved over to a different practice we, uh, made this past year. But um, we, there's lots of great scar lens fitters in our area. And scar lenses are by far 
the game-changing technology that makes a difference for our patients with keratoconus. Um, imagine that instead of an RGP lens that's, that rests on the cornea in many cases, you have a scar lens that vaults, it vaults over the cornea so that um, there's fluid between the cornea um, and the lens, uh, so there's no touch, and it's less likely to cause you know, irritation of the surface. You don't avoid the scarring that develops in many patients with keratoconus. When you see apical scars, is often because the, the RGP lens isn't fitting properly and it's resting on that cone and rubbing. So these technologies have been such a game changer. So many examples of patients with the worst of the worst keratoconus, you know, you know K-max above 90 that they're wearing scar lenses and can see and function quite well. So I think in summary, um, you know, cataract surgery and cataracts and and, um, and uh, keratoconus go hand in hand. Um, you know, I'm just gonna jump here. Um, we see patients with cataracts all the time that when you scan them, they will have some degree of keratoconus that may be mild, maybe moderate, maybe more advanced. Uh, I did have a patient today that had quite advanced uh, keratoconus that I did, um, that I had to put a Plano um, IOL in today because they had such advanced uh, keratoconus. Um, we see this all the time. And the good news is that uh, we have lots of treatment options for them. We can uh, treat them, you know, perform cataract surgery, uh, provide cross-linking, make a difference in their lives. And then uh, if they need it, they can also get scleral lenses. So they they now can get to a place and, and see better than they ever have been able to see before. And also you can prevent them from getting much worse. Um, so I hope this is a good overview. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think the one question that I know is going to come up is how you determine whether to cross-link first or perform cataract surgery first. And the answer is quite simple, in my mind at least. If the patient has a cataract that, that is quite visually significant, you just remove that first. Um, whether you perform uh, cross-linking today or six weeks from now, it's not usually not going to make a major, major difference. If you wait four months or five months, it does, it's more, there's more progression. But you know, four to six weeks is not a big deal, even two months. Um, so I would do cataract surgery first, get them seeing much better, um, try to end up a little bit on the myopic side. And then once they've kind of stabilized and healed, then you could offer the cross-linking procedure. You also have a better baseline because if you cross-link first, um, one, the improvement in coronal shape takes months and years, so it's not right away. And second, um, you know, if you, there, you perform a crossing procedure, and they, they even though you tell them they're not going to see better, they kind of are hoping they're going to see better. So it's, I think it's better to do the cataract surgery where you get them seeing better, and they're already happier with their vision, and then do the cross linking. So with that, um, I hope this is a helpful overview uh, talk on cat cataracts and keratoconus. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Trattler. Uh, you are, in fact, a mind reader and were able to predict the first question. Uh, I do have one follow up on that. Uh, if you do the cross linking first, uh, how long do you wait after the cross linking before cataract surgery? Great, great question. So, um, in the US, uh, the, you know, the technology we have FDA approved is called the Avidro KXL system, which is an epi off system. So, in that, in that patient, we're going to, the epithelium will be removed. Um, the um, procedure will be performed and the epithelium will heal over five to seven days. After the procedure, the first month, the, the Ks are actually steeper. And then by three months, they get back to baseline. So I probably target anywhere between three and six months after cross-linking to then do the cataract surgery because the Ks won't be that accurate for the first couple months. I would also be prepared to know that the Ks will often get flatter over the course of the first year and even the first few years. So I, I would fudge in that direction, you know, so that I don't end up, um, you know, placing a lens that, that's more or less Plano today, and they flatten to, so they end up hyperopic a year from now. So I hope that's a good overview. Great, that was, thank you. Um, going back to the slide where you showed the uh, Barrett Torque with the EKR case um, and the uh, uh, IOL Master case, um, which I will power what do you have ultimately chosen for the patient? Well, that's a great question. So um, if I'm using the EKR, I'm, I'm still going to target a little bit of myopia just for a variety of reasons. I, I still want to end up on the myopic side because there's still a chance, you know, because there's some variability that we could still end up more hyperopic than intended. Um, the, the IOL calculations were never developed for steep, steep, steep Ks over you know, over 50. So they're not really that validated in that level. So I, I just target more myopia. Um, and also, if we're going to do cross-linking a year after surgery, half, six months after surgery, 
We want them hyper myopic because they're going to typically get some degree of hyperopic shift after crossing. They'll get just a little bit flatter. I'm not hugely flatter, but just a mild flattening over months and years. So I, I would target usually minus one with EKR. I'm typically targeting more like a minus two uh, with keratoconus patients with, with that where I'm using biometry Ks. Um, if I'm not using the EKR, uh, but you know, sometimes you have to target minus three or minus four, depending on the severity of the keratoconus. Great. All right. When evaluating for symmetry, uh, so you can decide whether a toric IOL is appropriate or not, are you only kind of looking centrally, uh, say in like the central like three millimeter zones at the entire pupil diameter or at the entire cornea? Great question. I think the most important area is the first, is the very center of the cornea, uh, individual axis, the first three millimeters or so. Um, Obviously, at nighttime, they, if there's some irregularity, they may get a little blurring at nighttime. But you know, if you can get them seeing quite well for most of the time, they can be quite happy. Um, so that's what I typically do. So I'm typically focusing on the central area and looking for some symmetry. Um, and by symmetry, I'm looking at the axis being somewhat regular, not too skewed, and also that the powers are relatively symmetrical. So again, like the case I showed you where it was like 50 on one side and 45 on the other, there's a lot of asymmetry, and they may be quite unhappy, even though you're helping some, to some degree, they may still be quite unhappy. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions, a few more questions on toric IOLs uh, in patients with keratoconus. Um, do you take into consideration whether the patient uh, uses RGPs already at all? <clears throat> right, well, your decision is going to be, if I perform cataract surgery, will this patient be able to see well enough that they won't need RGP lenses? Uh, or scar lenses. Um, you know, I, I typically like scar lenses better than RGP lenses. So that's what you're trying to figure out. So if this patient has terrible keratoconus and you know they're going to go back to their hard contact lenses, then it's better not to use a toric lens because it's more difficult to fit a RGP lens or a scar lens. It's not impossible, but it's just much more challenging. So that's a, so that is an important consideration. If they have mild to you know to moderate keratoconus, and you think that you could perform proceed cataract surgery, get them to see better, and if they may not need an RGP lens, um, which is possible, then you, you can go with the torque lens and it reminds, tell the patient that they're actually, their goal is to get them out of RGP lenses, so that's why they're gonna have this scar lens. Great, thank you. All right. And uh, how does a patient having, like having keratoconus, uh, change how you follow up with patients post cataract surgery? So, um, I'm a, obviously I love imaging my patients' corneas with tomography and topography. And so my standard is that for my patients with, who've had a history of LASIK, every new LASIK patient, gets a topography that comes in my office. I like to make sure that they don't have any signs of ectasia and have a baseline. And for my cataract patients, the same thing. When they come in, I get a baseline topography or tomography. Uh, right now we're using uh, Pentacam for our patients coming in for cataract surgery. Um, and then after surgery, I typically, if they, if they do have keratoconus, I'm really gonna, I typically will image them about three months later to make sure they're relatively stable. And that's when we will talk about whether or not cross-linking is an option. If they decide that they're doing reasonably well and they don't, they say, I want to wait for progression, which is their choice, of course, then I'll typically see them back about nine months later, so the one year anniversary, and then see them once a year after that. Obviously, they have cross linking, and then they'll follow the cross linking protocol. Uh, they undergo the procedure, we'd see them postoperatively, and then I typically, once they're really stable, they go once a year. They come to see me once a year. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Trattler. That is all the time we have for tonight, but I've really enjoyed your presentation. And uh, on behalf of Oculus, thank you for your presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone, who both attended and sent in questions. Thank you, everyone. All right. From Oculus, I hope you have a good night. Thank you.